Good luck to everybody. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. You turn the corner in a long, dank hallway. Through the haze at the end of the hallway, you can see a single torch illuminating a door. What do you do? Um, cool. So maybe uh, maybe the best way to start is um, with the with the TV show. So, Dallas, you were um, tapped on the shoulder in some way to end up becoming, as far as I know, New Zealand's first ever dungeon master on our television screen. So, could you just tell me a little bit about how that happened? Well, yeah. Um, I'm sitting at home, and um, the creator of AFK web series, Peter Haynes, messaged me on Facebook and says, hey, you play Dungeons and Dragons, right? And I'm like, yeah, duh, hello. And he goes, contact these people. They're doing a, um, a reality show, and they want to do Dungeons and Dragons. And I contacted them. They know nothing about Dungeons and Dragons. So I said, look, I'm happy to, to consult. I've got all the books. I've got all the gear. I've got costumes, connections. Um, I've been doing this for God, since the mid seventies. And, um, yeah, I can do whatever you need me to do and make it happen. So they had me write a short adventure and a way to make it happen within the, uh, the reality competition kind of framework. And that wasn't easy because as we know, the Dungeons and Dragons is not really a competitive sport. Mm, that's right. So I'm trying to figure out a way to, to get these kids some, um, I say kids, get these people some, um, some competition points and that's not easy to do <laughs> it's just yeah. so that took me about two weeks to come up with a come up with a format and i submitted it and they ran with it so here we are wow that's fantastic that's fantastic so the um the approach that they take in that show is uh, like every year they focus in on a different aspect of the year and so it sounds like they just decided 1984 of all the things that happened there's it was the 10th anniversary of dungeons and dragons maybe maybe that's a good idea and then as soon as your name came to them they thought right you you can do it and we'll just give a thumbs up to what you come up with is within yeah, those yeah yeah well, I mean, in 84 um i yeah. mean that was a highly satanic panic wasn't it yeah i mean everybody was coming out with the check tracks against dungeons and dragons and how we're all you know sacrificing babies in the basement and you know i'm, I'm just like i'm playing the wrong game because i've never I've sacrificed more than one pizza but never a baby <laughs> So you got into the game in the seventies. You were you were one of the a real OG player right in the in the early days. What was your origin story with Dungeons and Dragons? How did you first hear about it? Um, just a bunch of mates of mine decided to uh, start playing this game, and they said we need another person. And you know, hey, let's get Dallas. He'll do anything. So they brought me in, and it was Saturday night, sitting around having pizza and pictures of Pepsi, and you know, just rolling dice and having fun. It wasn't. Uh, I mean we weren't purists at that point we were learning the game so we it was more of a social occasion at that point mm -hmm. and um, you know the, the group that brought me in were not like social butterflies they were you know kind of the kind of the geeky nerdy kids that you know, we didn't have the big marvel um, franchises and great tv like that to, to cater to the nerds and geeks at that time so we're looking to something to get into you know, and hey, why not Dungeons and Dragons? Yeah. So you were living in, was this, you were in Ohio at that time? Yeah, I was living in uh, Dayton, Ohio when I was, when I was growing up. I was born in upstate New York, but um, moved to Ohio. Oh gosh, I was probably seven or eight. Yeah. And um, went through everything since there. So, yeah. Cool. So was that just like a suburbs? You're a suburban kid? Uh, yeah, I was so kind of suburban, rural, semi-rural kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. small town, um, big school, yep. but you know, we, we gathered from everybody. So, right, right, right. Well, that's, that's kind of a lot of, uh, Dungeons and Dragons creators were kind of from that same, that same environment, weren't they? Where they came out of these very small towns. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, Gary, Gary was, um, Gary Gygax was, uh, from some little town in Wisconsin, mm. you know, that nobody had ever heard of. Yeah. <laughs> all of a sudden it's you know, round zero for fantasy and, and you know sci-fi and stuff yeah so in those early days no let me re rephrase this question when did you um pick up the dice to become a dungeon master and take control of the games like that because of course that's what you ended up doing on on our new zealand screens very recently yeah um most of my experience in playing is as a dungeon master um 
I saw, gosh, I've probably picked that up around the time right before Dragonlance came in. Mm-hmm. I, I just, I've read all the Dragonlance books. I've got all the paperbacks over here on the shelf. Um, read them all. Big fan of uh, Margaret Weiss, Tracy Hickman, and, and all the, the contributors to that world. And I just fell in love with it. I mean, something about the characterizations and, and the way they played off each other, it just really struck me. And I'm like, I could do this in D&D and just boom. So we started off, um, I was a player. I, I was playing a, a pre-roll of Raistolin. Mm-hmm. And um, things went on, things went on. Raistolin did the time of the, the test of the twins and got all this power. And I took Raistolin in a different direction in the books. Yeah. Um, he had uh, ambitions to become a lich. <laughs> so that's the, that's the direction we took him off. And, and once he got to this level of power, I couldn't play him anymore. Mm-hmm. So I just said, I told the dungeon master, look, I'll run a dragon lance or I'll run a, a gray hawk or, or something. And he said, sure. And off we went. And I started off with um, Temple of Elemental Evil, brand new party, first level, no experience. I mean, experienced players, but not, no experienced characters. Right. And we just ran from there. We went all the way through to um, uh, uh, Into the Underground and Queen of the Demon Web Pits and, yeah. you know, just that whole that whole series um, through Greyhawk. Yeah. And, so uh, so uh, any um, uh, Dungeons & Dragons uh, fans who are hearing this will be nodding along because what you're, you're citing are some of the kind of most iconic um, adventures yeah, yeah. that the game ever released. So it sounds like that, that you dove in to, to some of those those amazing early dungeons that really made the reputation of the game and, and were being yeah, shared Yeah, well, I mean, the, um, the Village of Hamlet was, was underdeveloped. I mean, severely underdeveloped. So that gave, you know, myself and other dungeon masters at the time, um, you know, the, the, the ability to... to go on to fly and just say, okay, I need an NPC. And we didn't have computers back then. And, and we had books and I had all these NPCs written down. I'd pull them up as I needed them, just like little mini stat blocks. Right. And, um, you know, we had a, a thriving, a thriving commercial village going there. Yeah. Wow. So, um, Nowadays, by trade, you are a performer of various stripes, doing um, in front of the camera, doing voiceover work, um, various other things. So um, a lot of yeah. people have kind of drawn a light line between role-playing games and, and the performing arts. Do you oh, yeah. yourself see a, a connection there? And how, how, would you, how do you approach that and think about that? Well, um, I've, I've always kind of been, since my high school days, I was in, involved in theater in school. I was one of those kids. Um, and, uh, Dungeons and Dragons just gave me the opportunity to, to let all these voices inside my head out. And, um, I came down here to New Zealand. I had, you know, I did, I did radio in the States for uh, forever. And, um, I came down here, thought I'd get straight into radio and everybody was like, look, we loved your CV, but that accent. And I'm like, I'm sorry. You know, it just, you know, maybe like it just doesn't market down here. And I'm like, that's cool. So on the way out, um, one of the uh, salespeople, one of the ad salespeople say, you know, look, I know we don't have a place for you here on air, but here's a friend of mine's card. She's a voice agent. And now I'm, you know, I'm making it a day what the DJs are making in a week. So um, <laughs> it works, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. And you um, ended up uh, acting in, in front of the camera for a couple of, a couple of really interesting roles. Was that something you ever, um, set out to do, or did you just fall into um, those things? I fell into this, man. I am a complete accidental actor. Yeah. Um, a voice agent that I was just mentioning, uh, sitting in her office, the casting director from Shortland Street is a friend of hers, um, Andrea. Andrea comes in, she goes, my God, I've been looking for you for a decade. Can you act? And I'm like, I don't know. So they um, ended up casting me to pretty much take out Karen Mitchell and Brody and you know, half the main cast uh, over two seasons. And um, that was, that was cathartic, man. (laughs) That was, that was a, that was a pretty big, um, a pretty big story arc right there. Um, When Karen Mitchell died and um, all the, all the mess that happened and uh, Holden and Regan and, 
it, get, it got to the point where I'd walk into the Shortland Street um, studios and main cast would be furiously thumbing through their script seeing who dies. <laughs> as soon as like, you turned up. <laughs> oh God, this guy's here again. Who's leaving? <laughs> so for any international listeners, the uh, Shortland Street, of course, is New Zealand's longest running uh, TV show, I think, apart from kind of current affairs. Oh. It's a uh, soap opera and um, it's, it's kind of one of these shows that has a tremendously high viewership, but a lot of people don't admit that they watch it, but I, I, the numbers do not lie. <laughs> it's yeah, it's yeah, incredibly no, I popular. <laughs> <laughs> I, I dip in and out of it. I, I do enjoy it. I love the, its commitment to just showing New Zealand life and just going yeah. balls to the wall on all whatever whatever crazy storyline they've dreamed up for that week. It's it's great TV fun. Lifetime. Yeah, so that's a that's a real New Zealand icon and. Um, also in front of the camera, you more recently worked with uh, Peter Jackson, another New Zealand icon and another um, yeah. iconic property. How'd that come about? Um, I had originally auditioned um, for the role of the Pale Orc, um, Azog. And obviously, I didn't get it because I'm not built like a like a Azog, right? Yeah. So um, I get I'm sitting at um, at a local burrito house here, and I don't want to name any names, but they're delicious. And uh, my phone rings, and my agent's on the phone. She says, can you get to Wellington? And I'm like, now I'm eating. She goes, no, 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 tomorrow morning, fine. I've got a plane ticket booked for you. Peter Jackson wants to talk to you. I'm like, who is this really? Come on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, I can go down there. I can, I can see what he says. And um, I get down there. It's Peter Jackson, Fran, and uh, Philippa sitting, at, sitting in, the, in the room. And they said, well, we, we like what you did. On, on tape, you're obviously not the Azo we're looking for. We've already found him, but we have a proposition for you. We don't have an opening for the film yet. We want to do it in Brie. Do you know who Bill Fernie is? And I'm like, yeah, I know who Bill Fernie is. I've been reading this book since I was eight, right? <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we want you to play Bill Fernie Sr., his father, um, kind of Warner Brothers canon, Bill Fernie Sr.'s father. Uh, yeah. Rumor going around is he's part orc. So, I mean, you know, he's at least a half orc. Um, I get down there. They were in pickups for the, the, I mean, the rest of the film has already been short shot. They don't have the opening. So they're building this costume around me, wow. putting yeah. big straps of leather around and buckling it all in, cutting it and making the boots and, you know, doing the makeup tests. And they shaved my eyebrows. I <laughs> said, um, Philip has said, you know, look, we're, look we're, do you mind if we shave your eyebrows? And I said, ma'am, Please excuse me, but at, at this rate, it's as Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings Hobbit. You can shave anything you want to shave. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think that got me to laugh. Um, the set down there was incredible. When I walked into Bree, it was, it was Bree. It was raining, and it was horrible, and it was dark, and there was all these dark crevasses and, and little windows. With, you, you, know, you, you saw people peeking out of them. It was wow. Bree. Yeah. Um, so I get down there and they walk me into the Prancing Pony and I'm almost in tears at this point because, you know, this has been like a dream of mine for 30 odd years. And um, I go over and Richard Armitage is sitting on a little short apple box to make himself look shorter. And he's already in character, man. And he's menacing. You know, I'm, I'm a big dude. I mean, I'm like, I'm like 185 and, and 150 kg. I'm a big dude. And this little bitty sitting at this table dwarf just glared at me. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, so, um, this guy, though, he is absolutely fun when he's not in character. Yeah. Um, and then, um, you know, the typical scenes of the, of the movie set and all this bustling going on and the room just goes dead silent. And um, everybody looks at the door and it's, you know, six foot gray ghost just wheels in. Wow. And it's Ian McKellen yeah. as Gandalf. And Peter takes me over and he says, um, he says, uh, Sir Ian, this is Dallas. He'll be, you know, the one of the main focuses of this, you know, of this scene. And, you know, we just thought you'd like to meet him. And I'm, well, I love it, Ian McKellen. I've watched all of his movies since, um, what was it, The Keep? Yeah. Um, back in 82, I think it was. Brilliant yeah. film. I mean, totally underrated film. I get over there and I'm just like, there's Ian McKellen standing in front of me, dressed as Gandalf. I lost it. I'm like, sorry, I'm a huge fan of yours. I just watched all your movies. And I stuck my hand out 
and he just kind of looks down at the hand, looks back up at me, looks down at the hand, and he goes, no, no, dear boy, you're family now. We don't shake hands, and he reaches out and he hugs me. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't know what to say, but I was just, I mean, he was the most generous actor I have ever worked with. He, I mean, we shared a green room together, and we just sat there and chewed the fat for like 45 minutes, half an hour, whatever. And um, he, is, he is just a, an amazing human. Wow. So, right. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like a, an incredible project to be part of. Absolutely incredible. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I got a, when the DVD came out, Blu-ray came out, I got a, um, a frantic message on Twitter from one of my followers. Oh my God, you've got a part in the special edition. I'm like what? And it's like, it's like this whole little section in the, in the behind the scenes, like we got this actor, Dallas Barnett, he's missing an eye. And, and I'm just <laughs> like, what? <laughs> nobody, nobody told me this was going to happen. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, I was You've like, got special feature, but without your, without your knowledge, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I, was like, I don't remember signing anything for that, but you know, good on you. Yep. <laughs> wow. So um, there's there's one other acting role that I I just want to uh, touch on before we get back to um, D and D and role playing games, and that is, of course is AFK. Um, so right. AFK is a is a web series, and it's been mm -hmm. um, running for a few series now. Do, do you want to just give a quick description of what it is for people who might not have heard of it? All right. Well, AFK is um is a group of MMO players, um, kind of world agnostic. We we can't really go into what video game or system with D&D it is. Um, it's assumed to be a video game, a large MMO. Um, it was uh, originally thought of by our creator, Peter Haynes, as, um, you know, a, a World of Warcraft, obviously, but we can't use World of Warcraft, so we had to generic it out. So it's a group of, AFK, or a group of um, MMO players that somehow wake up in the bodies of their online avatar. Um, and we've got, male to female character swips swaps sorry you know if i wanted to look at it if i'm going to look at an ass all day it's going to be a nice ass that kind of thing we've got um female to male total um species switch because she got tired of being um hit on and harassed all the time in the video game right um yeah. we've got my character which is Varuga the orc and i won't give any spoilers but he's a lot um more than he seems when you first meet him. Yeah. Um, it's a brilliant role. I mean, I, I absolutely love the role. And I think it's one of the fan favorites too. So, you know, that's uh, quite an honor for me to be involved in that part of it. Yeah, yeah. No, every, every time he popped up when I was watching, I, I always got a big smile on my face. And that was, yeah, it was before I knew who you were. Um, it's, just a, it's just a really cool character. It's really fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, he's it, well written. Um, yeah. uh, and major props to... Uh, Peter Haynes and Hui Lingao, um, they did a great job with, I mean, all the characterizations. Yeah. So, I mean, we're all gamers. The whole, the whole cast and 99% of the crew is some kind of gamer. We've got um, Callum Gittins, who plays Jack, who's a world-class um, Magic the Gathering player. Um, you know, everybody has played Warcraft. Um, I'm the D&D &D guru, so I can kind of add the D&D &D flair to the, to, the, um, to the series and you know, we're all nerds. We're all geeks. Um, yeah. Peter Haynes has an R2 D2 that he drives around town. <laughs> so. Awesome. So yeah. that brings us back to uh, back to save the eighties because one of the interesting things that I noticed watching this this episode is they introduce the subject of the of um, the episode is going to be Dungeons and Dragons and the contestants who were all um, kind of 20, 20 ish or low twenties, mid twenties, yeah, somewhere, yeah. somewhere in that ballpark. Um, even though it was, it was sold obviously as this is, this is the thing that the geeks and the nerds did back in 1984. Um, the reaction was very much not, this is, this is still nerd stuff. It was like, it seemed to be fully embraced by everyone there, which to me suggests that there has been a real culture shift that's, that's kind of been slowly unfolding over the time that you have been playing the game. What was your experience of being in that room with, with those people who I presume most, if not all, hadn't played the game before and how they reacted to well, it? What was that like? Surprisingly, um, quite a few of the contestants had already played. Um, team tracksuit was big, team, team shoulder, play, uh, shoulder pads plays, um, and... No, team neon, team tracksuit, and team shoulder play, shoulder pads all play. 
Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like, um, the, the culture wars are over and we won, bro. Yeah. Yeah. You know? <laughs> you know, we're finally in charge of the media. We're finally in charge of, of people's precious spare time. Yeah. You know, during the pandemic, everybody was clicking on Netflix and watching um, Spider Man and and you know all these all these Dungeons and Dragons um, r- real play kind of yeah. things. They're all watching all this stuff that that we had a part in developing and and playing and helping to raise it up into the into the cultural zeitgeist. The door creaks open. In the distance, you see a very large figure. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. Chained to a wall. Um. <laughs> Visitors, why don't you release me? And I will help you find the exit. I shut and lock the door behind us. Why'd you shut the door, Ed? <laughs> it's a little suspicious that Ed wants us in the room with the dragon. I have a massive treasure hoard. If you would just release me from my imprisonment, I will take you and you can have it all. I run up and I try and yank this, this chain off. As soon as your hand touches the collar, the dragon wheels around and snaps at you, taking your head and your upper torso clean off your body. You're dead. Oh. Oh. Well, it was it made for a, a really fun episode to watch. Um, I'm, I don't think we should spoil it for, for people who are listening to this because I strongly recommend you seek it out and, and watch it. It's just a, it's very, very fun. And some of the things that those players get up to and the contributions they make just are, are very, oh, yeah. I mean, very the, entertaining. Yeah, the one, the one section where um well i won't go into any spoilers but when i turned and went jesus christ that was real that was not edited in from someplace else yeah i was just like, yeah she did <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and after you've seen the episode you will know exactly the bit that Dallas is referring to there yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah that was uh, yeah. The place where it landed <laughs> Yeah, so there was some, uh, there was some real, there's some great surprises, I suppose, in that in that episode. So um, yeah, seek it out and watch it. We won't go into um, some of the the back end of things, but I'll just ask, at the other end of that, what was what was your kind of vibe walking away from it, and um, like what was, is there anything anything more to the story apart from spoiling exactly what happens on camera? No, um, you know the 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 contestants, the uh, the young people they had on there were spectacular. They were a lot of fun to work with. Um, you know, the, the production team was, I mean, they had everything ducks in a row the entire time. I didn't have to wait. I just went in, did my thing. And, um, you know, they had secured, uh, different props and costumes for the time. And, um, yeah, it was good. It was good. And, and I would like to thank, uh, the Auckland LARP community for, a huge contribution to that episode. They brought in um, a lot of their weaponry and, and costumes and just fitted everybody out just stunningly. Yeah. Yeah. It's visually, it's, it's quite a treat watching everyone, everyone try out the costumes and things. It's yeah. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I am, I am kind of sorry. I lost my two fighters early in the game though. Um, yeah. Before, before we did what we did eventually, because I would have loved to see those guys role play because the, yeah. uh, the, um, the guy with the long black hair, um, team shoulder pads, mm. he was a brilliant role player. And um, the young man, um, the blonde, cute kid, um, <laughs> uh, he was also a brilliant role player. And I, yeah. I was sorry I lost them early because I think it would have taken it up another another step. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I, I think how it unfolded with those two out, it kind of raised the stakes for everyone else. And it was fascinating watching some of the others step up to fill that fill the gap there so maybe maybe it actually worked out in, in an interesting way along there yeah it made it very interesting she was supposed to shoot across the road in um in cornwall park by one tree hill right but it was just hammer and rain yeah. all day long well we're gonna have to like drop back and and do something so we decided to shoot it inside alexandria park which is yeah. a, a horse horse race um compound here convention center so we're yeah. going up we're going up the, uh, the escalator of sadness and you know, <laughs> read it all okay um he was a brilliant brilliant mind um in the computers before computers were really a thing you know all, all the kids in my neighborhood had snuck playboys out of their dad's 
sock drawer and everything. And he had like a Crutchfield catalog that he would pour over. Yeah. Um, his dad was my eye doctor and that's how we, that's how we met. Right. Um, and he was really into Dungeons and Dragons. He was, uh, he graduated from high school, I think at 16. I've only played with him once. Um, yeah. We weren't exactly friends mm -hmm. mostly because, you know, Dallas didn't have many friends. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, uh, he got into his D and D because his parents were so hard on him and that was the only way he could escape. Yeah. Um, he played all through high school. He played all through university. Um, we ended up in the basement of Wright state university, the, uh, access tunnels of Wright state university in um, Fairborn Beaver Creek, Ohio, um, playing uh, a couple of games. And then he shoots off to, I think it was MIT mm. or university of Michigan, something like that. And, gets caught in I don't know some kind of some kind of weird um underground game uh, um, where he just gets completely into the character and ends up killing himself um good kid didn't deserve that um yeah. there was a private investigator that his parents had hired because they couldn't see that maybe they were the ones that were pushed him too hard. Mm -hmm. So they hired a private investigator to pour over and find out what in his life made him kill himself. Mm -hmm. So this guy comes in here and he's like, he's central casting. This guy's right out of central casting, right? Yeah. Comes in and he's asking all these questions and yada, yada, yada. And you know, was he gay? Was he a drug, drug user? I want to go on record here. James Dalex Egbert was not gay. Okay. He didn't care. He, I mean, if, if anything, he was on a spectrum of, of the LBGTA of ACE. Mm. There was no thought in his mind of a relationship with any male or female. All he wanted to do was computers and dungeons and dragons. He didn't care about anything else. So he was, you know, by definitions used today, he was at least ACE or some spectrum of. Um, drug dealer or a drug drug addict. Um, you know this was like the early late seventies, early eighties. If you didn't do a handful of quaaludes on a Saturday night, your life was wasted. You know everybody smoked weed, everybody did quaaludes. Nobody got. I mean, I survived. Yeah. You know, <laughs> everybody everybody during that time pretty much came out of it okay and and wiser for the experience. Um. You know, he was not a Satanist. He didn't care about any kind of religion. You know, all he cared about, like I said, was computers and Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. Um, and anything, anything else you hear is somebody trying to make a buck off of his name, and that's wrong. Yeah. You know, he was a good kid. Yeah, yeah. So in the aftermath of, of that storyline, given that it was close to home for you and, and your community, did you, did you kind of feel the mood of the of the um people around you shift towards the game oh, and oh, yeah, yeah 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 our high school and it and you couldn't carry a player's handbook in school and you know all this because it's it's dayton ohio right it's yeah. satan's coming to get your kids and the mom and dad were were losing their minds about this new game that's that's killing their kids and and they burning the books in the street and throwing them in the trash and you know our local game shop you know, made out like bandits during that time because everybody was rushing out to buy a new player's handbook. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's, that is really interesting to me because like one of, one of the stories that people tell about that satanic panic period, which kind of began around um, those events and sort of ran through the, the early eighties to kind of 84, 85 um, yeah. was that the game was getting popularity and, and people were getting into the game because they heard about this, this notorious dangerous activity and found their way into it and then realized it was, there was a lot of math involved. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you know, I'm horrible at math. I can't, yeah. you know, I'm still a finger counter at this point. I'm horrible at math. I always have been, but you know, I can roll up, I can roll up six dice six and, and count them in the back of my head while I'm still talking to you. Yeah. You know, and, you know, that, that's helped me. Um, and so, I mean, like I said, getting the characters out, getting the, the emotional um, nonsense out through your yeah. characters is cathartic. The same as being in front of a camera. Yeah. Um, when I put all these, all these angry, scary, and, and weepy roles on TV, it's, it's like I, I can do this here in the safety of this set and not have to blow up on, you know, my cat. 
Yeah. You know, I, I get it out in a controlled, safe environment and, and it helps. So, I mean, that's my take on it. And it helped me become a better actor, I think. Fantastic. Well, that's probably a really good point to, to wind things up. You've, um, yeah, your, your experiences taking you from right back in the seventies through to the 2020 television debut of played D and D in New Zealand. Um, it's a pretty exciting time. Great to talk to you, Dallas. Is there anything, anything you have coming up is probably a weird question given what's going on in the world, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Is there anything you've got coming up? Well, we're trying to get season three of AFK going. We had to cancel out our, um, our, uh, kickstarter right in the uh, middle of it because corona hit and um we just didn't feel right about asking people for 20 bucks when they don't know when the next rent, rent payment is going to come so as soon as we get some kind of stability left in the world we're back into it we've got a patreon look us up on that there's a, a mid-season uh, graphic novel being done on patreon that'll tell it tell the story between season one and season two cool, cool. <laughs> Fantastic. Great to talk to you, Dallas. Thank you. Great talking to you, man.